Well, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Walking Through the Scriptures with Joseph Bahoda. I'm your host, Joe Bahoda, and I'm starting a series basically tearing down the golden calves, meaning the stuff that we have built, or tearing down the sacred cows of church. And this series is going to offend some. Uh, it definitely may tick some people off, particularly if you've been discipled or brainwashed by a lot of institutionalized churches. Um, this this will really ruffle your feathers. I, I'm just being going to be blatantly honest with you. For some of you all, though, this is going to be a um, <clears throat> an eye-opening, um, definitely an enlightening series. So some of you all enjoy it because some of you all will learn things you didn't see before. For others, this will be a, basically a, you know, refreshing glass of cold water on a hot desert day. Uh, this will be confirmation. This will be like, praise God, I'm not crazy. I was seeing that same thing too, Joe. Thank you for saying it, if you will, because I was, I was seeing the same thing or I thought the same thing or, you know, I'm not crazy, man. This, this series is confirmation because we're wasting a lot of money like on buildings and, you know, these mega rock star celebrity pastors and all this kind of stuff. And we're like, you know, is that biblical? And we're going to find out a lot of it's not. So, but a couple of things with that. With that being said, we're going to go through this book here by Frank Viola and George, George Barna. Um, and this is a really, really good book. It's called Pagan Christianity. Pagan Christianity. Um, and we're just going to be going through it. And I'm basically going to do like one section or one chapter at a time. I'm just going to go through this slowly. I've already read this years and years and years ago. And I highlighted some stuff that we should um, kind of know about. Now, a couple of things with this book. And also, he wrote a part two of this called Re Re Reimagining Church. Excuse me, Reimagining Church. That's like part two of this book. So I highly recommend you get Reimagining Church as well. One of the things, however, I disagree with Frank Friola on is just give you admin straight up out the way. He kind of makes it sound like the first century church was leaderless. Um, I respectfully disagree with that. You know, the Apostle Paul, you know, he said to Titus in Titus chapter 1, go and appoint elders in every church, in every church. And we're going to see today that a lot of these churches were home churches, okay, which I've talked about many, many times in our uh, videos that I've done with you, to, you know, already. Um, but elders in every church, that word elder in the Greek is presbytery, or, which is where we get our word presbyterian, which means overseer. So you always had oversight. There was always leaders or leadership within these home churches. It wasn't just people just doing willy-nilly whatever they wanted to do. Because one, you had to make sure that you know people were you know teaching sound doctrine, but you also had to make sure that people were doing things right and the meetings didn't get you know out in left field somewhere. You had to have make sure that you know when people came together and worshiped God and they broke bread and they, they did communion and all that, and when they got their teaching, you had to make sure that these meetings didn't go out in left field. Okay? Now, he does say, well, first of all, so the number one sacred cow, the first one we're going to do, and these are not in any particular order, I'm just going to go in the order of the book, is the church building, the sacred cow of the church building itself. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include this in my description of this video, because I've already talked about this on my channel before. Remember about a month or so ago, I did a live, uh, and, and the picture was like, the church is this, i.e. people, and it showed a picture of people worshiping, and then it's not this, and then I showed a big old church building. So I already did a live on this. The word church is the word in Greek, ekleosia, which means gathering or assembly. Or a gathering or assembly of whom? In this case, believers. So the church is believers, not a building. So you don't go to church. It's impossible for you to physically to go to church because we're supposed to be the church. Okay? So you don't go to a building. We just do that for convenience sake, and we just do that for here in America because that's how we do church in America. But biblically, it's not, it's not how they did it, okay? So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Now, I, I do like what he says here in, in his footnotes, okay? Because he is a proponent of the home church, Frank Viola is, but he says this. He says, interesting and organic church will have problems identical to those in the first century church. So be, if you decide to go to a home church, don't think that your problems are going to be over. They're not. Okay, there's problems in home churches too, which a lot of the letters in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul was addressing some of that. Great example of that. The whole entire book of 1 Corinthians was about that. Because if you read, first, go back and read 1 Corinthians. It was, it was reported to me, basically a lot of you Corinthians were doing sin. And then Paul addresses that sin. But he says, it was reported to me 
from members of Chloe's household. So this sister named Chloe had a home church in her house. And there were some people doing dirt in her house. Guess what? So the people of that home church reported to Paul. And Paul says, it was reported to me that you guys were doing X, Y, and Z. Guess what? It was reported to me by the people in Chloe's home church. And Paul was responding back to that home church in Chloe's household. Guess what, y'all? That's, that's the book of 1 Corinthians. <laughs> See, a lot of y'all don't think of it like that because we've not, been, we've not been taught home church. We've been taught this great big building, okay? So he says, but just because you go to a home church doesn't mean all your problems are over. That's not true. But he also says, on the other hand, the institutionalized church, which is the big church building, paid staff, paid clergy, all of that, uh, faces a completely different set of problems, which have no biblical antidote since its structure is so distinct from the New Testament church. For instance, an institutionalized church, the laity may not like their preacher, so they fire him. This never would have happened in the first century church because there was no such thing as a hired pastor. Now, the Apostle Paul does tell the Corinthians, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians, is like, look, you know, I, I could have taken you know, basically a monetary blessing from y'all, but I decided not to. That way y'all can't say that, you know, I'm getting rich off of you guys, okay? So let me just say this too. I am not against institutionalized church per se, as long as those churches are doing the right things. So as long as they're doing the right things and the pastor's doing the right things, um, I'm willing to work with it, okay? But I will say this. There is a lot of cons to the institutionalized church. One, the pastor's a figurehead. You know, basically the, the people just sit in the pews and, and they spectate. They don't participate. All those things are going to be highlighted in this book. So there's a lot, a lot of problems within the institutionalized church. There's almost zero, zero fellowship for the most part. And if you do fellowship, it's either in the lobby or it's you get fellowship after church is over. So during the service, you know, you get the praise and worship and you get the preached word. But really all you do is a person in the pews is sit your butt in the pews and then you just watch the show. Okay. That was never biblically how church was supposed to be. Remember in the, in the book of Acts, they met in homes and they had a meal together in communion and fellowship. And then in that, they said they continued in the apostles' doctrine in people's homes. Biblically, that was how it was done. Also that too, we talked about this before. I've talked about this and I highlighted this on my channel before. Communion wasn't just a little grape juice and wafer that you, you, know, you drank and you ate. Communion was actually a communal meal. I, that's why it's called the Last Supper. It's the supper that Jesus had with his disciples. That's what communion is. Communion should have been a communal meal amongst believers. And I, I've done a video about that too, about how we were doing communion wrong. All that is highlighted in this book. But again, first we're going to talk about the sacred cow of the church building itself. Amen? Um, so this is his proposal. This is Frank's proposal. We are also making an outrageous proposal that the church in its contemporary institutionalized form has neither a biblical nor a historical right to function as it does. This proposal, of course, is our, our conviction based upon the historical evidence that we shall present, present in this book. You must decide if the proposal is valid or not. Okay, so that's, that's their proposal. Okay, again, I'm willing to work with some of these churches, again, as long as um, these churches are doing the right things. Okay. But he's definitely going to tell you that some of this stuff is messed up. And this is a really eye-opening book. Now, some of y'all may be saying, well, Joe, in the Bible, it says, you know, when Peter and the, and when the disciples, when they first started preaching, they preached in the Jewish synagogue, okay? Which is true. However, though, we know through church history and also just, in, you know, history as a whole, in 70 AD, that Jewish synagogue got destroyed by the Romans. So they couldn't meet in the synagogue anymore because the synagogue didn't exist because the Romans came in and destroyed it. And also, too, as Christianity spread out of, like, Jerusalem and out of the Middle East, if you will, and started to go to Europe and different parts like that, Christianity became more and more Gentile. And as that happened, people started to get out of the big old, you know, these big old buildings itself. And he says this on page 6. He says, after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, Judaic Christianity weaned in numbers and power. Gentile Christianity dominated, and a new faith began to absorb Greco-Roman philosophy and ritual. Judaic Christianity survived in the, for five centuries in a little group called Syriotic Christians, or Ebian, 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 I think I'm saying that right, but their influence was not very widespread. According to Shirley J. Case, not only was the social environment of the Christian movement largely Gentile well before the end of the first century, 
but it had severed almost any earlier bonds of social contact with the Jewish Christians of Palestine. By the year 100, Christianity is mainly a Gentile religious movement, living together in a common Gentile social environment. Now, that is a very key sentence. Because what happened, as we know, after the apostles died, the apostles were all Jewish. Therefore, originally, Christianity, by the way, everybody, was a Jewish movement. Okay? So it reflected a lot of, you know, Judaism or, not Judaism, but like the early followers of Christianity weren't even called Christians. They weren't called Christians until Acts chapter 11 in Antioch, a Gentile city in Turkey. Okay? What were Christians called before they were called Christians? They were called the way. And I believe that's in Acts chapter 9. They were called the way. And the way were basically Jewish believers that believed that Jewish was Messiah and they believed that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior as Jewish believers. Hence, that's what the book Hebrews is about. Hebrews were Jewish believers that believed in Christ. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, don't go back to Judaism. Don't go back to the Old Testament and all that because Jesus is superior to all that. Okay? But as Christianity grew, it became more and more Gentile, if you will, in its flavor, particularly as Paul was going to these Gentile cities and preaching the gospel to the Gentiles in these Gentile nations, in these Gentile countries. So therefore, as Christianity spread, it became more and more Gentile as it went on and then too, the apostles and stuff eventually died. So therefore, once they died, then it eventually spread out and became more and more Gentile in its nature. Now, with that being said... As it became more and more Gentile, particularly when, when Constantine came along about 300 years later, guess what? He basically said Christianity now is going to be the official religion of the empire, which, by the way, it's not that he wanted to, he was a big Christian and he, he wanted that. No, he did it to unify the empire. Okay? Well, what they did is, guess what? Well, now, now the Christians went from the persecuted ones to the cool kids, and the cool kids now get to tax the people, and now they started build, building these great big church cathedrals. Okay? Because now you're not meeting in secret or, you know, in catacombs or in people's homes. Now you can pay taxes to the church and now you can start building these big old building projects. Okay? Because you're not the persecuted ones anymore. And now you're the cool kids that have the power and the money. Okay? So there was a lot, a lot of stuff messed up with it. Okay? But, so let's get into it. So... Um, again, here I said here, strikingly, nowhere in the New Testament do we find the terms church, ecclesia, temple, or house of God used to refer to a building. To the ears of the first century Christian, calling the ecclesia a church building would have been liking calling your wife a condominium or your mother a skyscraper. Again, I said that earlier. Ecclesia were the called out ones, or it was the gathering or the assembly of, of the people. Ecclesia are church is people, not a building. Okay, by AD 190, Clement of Alexandria, Clement was also the first person to use the phrase going to church or go to church, which would have been a foreign thought to the first century believers because you cannot go to something that you are. Okay, even so, Clement's reference to going to church is not a reference to attending a special building for worship. It rather refers to a private home that the second century Christians used for their meetings. Christians did not erect special buildings for worship until the Constantinian area in the 4th century. See, that's what I just said. Constantine initiated a lot of this stuff. Um, let's see. In another work, he writes, the first churches consistently met in homes. Until the year 300, we know of no buildings first built as churches. Um, neither did they have a special priestly caste that was set up to serve God. Here we go. Instead, every believer recognized that he or she was a priest unto the Lord. Now, yes and no. <clears throat> this is where I, would, I wish Frank would elaborate a little bit more. What he's advocating here is there was no you know, priestly system, or there was no hierarchical system where you had like these bishops or you had like these you know, priestly hierarchy above the people. He's right in the sense that's how it was, not so, it was never supposed to be that. Now, that's how it kind of was in the Old Testament. You know, you had the priest that would minister on behalf of the people once a year and all that, you know, the Day of Atonement and all that. But the Bible says now in 1 Peter 2, 9, that we are all now a royal priesthood of all believers. So there is no Levites anymore. There is no priesthood of Aaron. God did away with that through Jesus Christ. So he's right. It, it should have never been that priestly caste hierarchy system that we have. Unfortunately, though, around or about, you know, I think it was AD 66 and stuff, you'll see 
there was bishops or overseers like in Smyrna in different cities. And <clears throat> the reason that happened, and if you go back to listen to my church history class, one of the reasons that happened is because once the apostles died, or were about ready to die, the church started asking the question, well, when these guys die, who's going to be next in charge? And they, they developed a system called apostolic succession. Now, I personally believe that apostolic succession was a mistake. Because the church shouldn't have been asking who's going to be next in charge. It should have said, how do we, the question should have been, how do we continue to complete our mission? And how do we continue to serve and serve Christ? Because what did Jesus say? If you want to be the greatest of all, be the servant of all. So how do we serve the kingdom? And two, how do we continue to do our kingdom mission? Okay, which is what I, I love that question that Alan Russell and his wife Lisa posed on his channel, Church Dropout. That's always the question. How do, how do we continue to serve the kingdom and how do we continue to, to complete our kingdom mission? That's the question, not how do, who's going to be in charge next after the apostles die. Wrong question. Well, they asked that question, they answered that question, and that's how the whole bishop, overseer, hierarchical system, the caste system, as you call it, got set up. Because they were saying, who's going to be next in charge? Wrong question, okay? <clears throat> Um, let's see. I'm just, I'm just kind of going through the book here, guys. I'm trying to do it as, as best as I can. Um, it says they believe the body of Christ, the church constitutes a temple. Okay. When Roman Catholicism evolved in the fourth to the sixth centuries, it absorbed many of the religious practices of both pagan and Judaism. Again, we talked about the old Testament priesthood. It set up professional priesthood. It erected sacred buildings and it turned the Lord's supper into mysterious sacrifice. Again, it's that it was never supposed to be that called the Eucharist. The Lord's Supper was exactly that. It was a communal meal that believers had one with another. That's another sacred cow, if you will. This given a little vial of grape juice and wafer called communion. It was actually a communal meal in the Bible. Following the path of the pagans, early Catholicism adopted the practice of burning incense and having vestal sacred, sacred virgins. The Protestants dropped the, the sacrificial use of the Lord's Supper, the burning of incense, and the vestal virgins but they retained the priestly caste, the clergy, as well as the sacred building. So even though we had the Reformation, and even though we, a lot of us broke away from Catholicism, we still kept a lot of the same stuff. The priestly caste system, i.e. the leadership, and the building. Okay, So that hierarchy and building stayed the same even in Protestantism. That did not change. Okay? Let's see. Um... Okay, although surrounded by Jewish synagogues and pagan temples, the early Christians were the only religious people on earth who did not erect sacred buildings for their worship. The Christian faith was born in homes, out in courtyards, and alongside roadsides. Christians did not begin calling their buildings temples until the 15th century. So what happened is the Christians picked up from their pagans the practice of having meals and honor, um, and honor the dead. Okay, both the Christian funeral, this is an interesting fact, both the Christian funeral and the Funeral dirge came straight out of paganism in the third century. That's an interesting little footnote too. I guess they did. This is just me hypothesis. I don't know. Maybe they did like celebration of life services in a certain in certain um, Christian circles. You'll see that. I don't really know what the first century church did when a, when a saint died. Um, that I'd have to research more. That I don't know. But it's an interesting little footnote here in his book. Okay. Um. Again, we talked about Constantine. Once, once he basically made Christianity the official religion, that's when the buildings started going up. Um, here it is, Constantine. This is another thing Constantine did. Interestingly, this is on page 21. Interesting, he named his church buildings after saints, just as the pagans named their temples after gods. Constantine built his first church buildings upon the cemeteries where the Christians held meals for the dead saints. That is, he built them over the bodies of dead saints. Why? Because of, of at least of a century beforehand, the burial places of the saints were considered holy spaces. The most famous Christian holy spaces were St. Peter's on the Vatican Hill, built over the supposed tomb of Peter. St. Paul's outside the walls, built over the proposed tomb of Paul. The dazzling and astonishing church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, built over the supposed tomb of Christ. And the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, built over the supposed cave of Jesus' birth. Constantine built nine churches in Rome and many others in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Constantinople, which is now modern-day Turkey, which is modern-day Turkey, okay? It was Constantinople then. It's called Istanbul now, 
Um, again, the Eucharist, now viewed as a sacred sacrifice, was offered upon the altar. No one but the clergy who were regarded as holy men were allowed to receive the Eucharist within the alt altar rails. So that is, that's why you have Roman Catholicism, you know, given what they say is the Eucharist to the people. Again, that was never supposed to be communion. It was always supposed to be a communal meal. That was always how it was supposed to be done. And once again, this gave birth to the clergy versus laity system. So as we go on in this book, we're going to talk about, you know, the sacred cow of the pulpit and even the sacred cow of, of the, 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 the paid, you know, pastoral staff and even the sermon itself. Now, that doesn't mean I'm against the word of God. No, we should have the word of God, but there's a way in which you deliver it to where the pastor isn't the everything person. And he becomes the figurehead of the church. Hallelujah. We're going to be talking about that too in this book. Okay. But right now we're still dealing with the sacred cow of the church building. And this is how it happened. The sermon was preached from the bishop's chair. The power and authority rested in the chair, which was covered with a white linen cloth. The elders and deacons sat on either side of it in a semicircle. The hierarchical distinction embodied in the basilican architecture is unmistakable. Interesting, most present-day churches have special chairs for the pastor and his staff situated on the platform behind the pulpit. Like the bishop's throne, the pastor's chair is usually the largest of them all. All this is a clear carryover from the, the pagan basilica. And if you go to a lot of churches today, you will see this. Either they have a big old pulpit set in the middle of the congregation where the, where the pastor preaches from, or you have a big old pulpit in the middle of the stage. Behind the pulpit on the stage is a big old pastor's chair, and in all of the little chairs next to it, Excuse me, where the ministers and the elders of the church sit. So all the leadership sits on the stage where the pastor's chair is the biggest one behind the pulpit. And then the people in the pews are just the people in the pews and they sit in the pews. That tradition is still going on today, y'all. It's still going on today. All of it is not biblical. Okay. So, let's see. I'm skipping some of this because there's just a lot in here, okay? Um, now, what did, what did this bring, bring about? The upshot of it all was that there was a loss of intimacy and open participation. The professional clergy performed the acts of worship while the laity looked on as spectators. Guess what? That is still going on today. In most Sunday morning services, you have the praise and worship team. After the praise and worship team is over, then the pastor and his... The pastor or his other people will come up and give the sermon, and then you'll say a quick prayer or whatever, and then you go home. So basically, you come to church, you listen to the word, you listen to the praise and worship, and then you go home. You're just spectators watching the show. That was never how church was supposed to be. Remember, they met in homes, and they fellowshiped and communed in the apostles' doctrine as they fellowship with intimacy one with another in community. That's how church was done. It was never supposed to be a spectator sport which is what and how we've turned church into. Let me turn my light on real quick. That is what we've turned church into, is a spectator sport. And that was never how it was supposed to be. Okay? Um, let's see. Again, we talked about the architecture. Also, too, I'm not going to get into this. Um, on page 33, he talks about the actual pulpit itself. Now, if you guys watch one of my videos, I critiqued the video that, Costigan was interviewing Steve Lawson. And I said, Steve Lawson is not telling you the full story of the pulpit. And I critiqued that eight and a half minute interview because we have made the pulpit itself a sacred cow. Okay, we've turned it into an idol, if you will. Okay, and I got a whole video on that. So I'm going to go ahead and include that video too in the description of this too. So you can go back and rewatch that, okay? He has a section on this called the pulpit and he talks about that very thing. Um... It says, Cyprian of Carthage in 200 to 258 speaks of placing the leader of the church in a public office upon the pulpitum. In time, the phrase to ascend the platform became part of the religious vocabulary of the clergy. By AD 252, Cyprian alludes to the raised platform that segregated the clergy from the laity as the sacred and venerated uh, congestion of the clergy. Sound familiar? And that's how we have these mega rock star celebrity pastors today. It all started in the, in the 200s, guys. It all started in the 200. The pulpit elevates the clergy to a position of prominence. True to its meaning, it puts the preacher at center stage, 
separating and placing him above God's people. Okay? What this does is it gives birth to celebrity rock star pastors, but what it also does because of that, it creates this thing of pastor worship. Because anything the pastor says goes because he's, he's the most important person because he's the one delivering the word. So it leads to two things, rock star celebrity pastors. It also leads to pastor worship, but also what it does, since the people are just spectating, so I guess this is number three, it makes the people in the pews lazy because I don't have to read the word of God for myself. I just listen to this paid clergy person. Again, I talked about this in my Steve Lawson video. Okay? Which is what he says here on page 35. It, it immobilizes the congregation of the saints and renders them mute spectators. It hinders face-to-face -face fellowship and interaction. Exactly. That's exactly what it does. Um, it says here, they continue to maintain the unbiblical division between clergy and laity. And they encourage the congregation to assume a spectator role. The arrangement and mood of the building conditions the congregation towards passivity. Amen. The public platform acts like a stage, and the congregation occupies the theater. Welcome to a lot of megachurches, if you will, in modern-day churches. Also, too, he said, getting back to the building. Do you ever hear it spoken of as God's house? You'll hear that a lot. You know, it's good to be in the house of God again. Again, you're not really in the house of God because we, the body of Christ, are the house of God. We are the temple of the Lord. Okay? The general consensus among Christians, all of the denominations, that is that a church is essentially a place set apart for worship. That has been true for at least 1,700 years. Constantine is still living and breathing in our minds. See, what he's basically saying is, ever since Constantine in the 300s, we've been saying going to church and go to this building. And again, once he became emperor in the 300s he basically made christianity the official religion and then they started erecting these huge big church cathedral buildings here it is 1700 years later and we're still under constantinian rule as far as how we do churches again the early churches met in homes and we are the body of christ individually that's first corinthians chapter 6 where it says our temples are the body of the holy spirit but also we the people are are the temples of god or the houses of god that's first corinthians chapter 3 so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, corporately we are the house of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, individually our own bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 3 and 6. Now again, this is the same 1 Corinthians that was written to the home church that was in Chloe's household. <laughs> okay? That's the terminology and that's the stuff going on here. Okay? So with that being said, he's saying get rid of the sacred cow of the church building. Because he says here, this is really... Um, Interesting point. Contemporary Christians are spending an astronomical amount of money on their buildings. Check this out. The church edifice demands a vast infusion of money. In the United States alone, real estate owned by institutionalized churches today is worth $230 billion. I'm going to read that again. The church edifice demands a vast infusion of money. In the United States alone, the real estate owned by institutionalized churches today is worth $230 billion. Church building debt, service, and maintenance consumes about 18% of the 50 to 60 billion tithe to churches annually. Saints, that is crazy. <laughs> that is absolutely crazy. Okay? <clears throat> so it, it's, just, it's just crazy. Okay? Um, I'm going to go ahead and read this and I'm going to go ahead and stop. We have become victims of our past. We have been fathered by Constantine, who gave us the prestigious status of owning a building. We have been blinded by the Romans and Greeks, who forced upon us their hierarchy-structured basilicas. We have been taken by the Goths, who imposed upon, upon their Platonic architecture. We have been hijacked by the Egyptians and Babylonians, who gave us our sacred steeples. And we have been swindled by the Athenians, who imposed us their Doric columns. Somehow we have been taught to feel holier when we are in the house of God, again the building, we have inherited a pathological dependency upon an edifice to carry out our worship to God. What he's basically saying, since we inherited all this pagan stuff, we think we need a building to worship God. No, we don't. We just need each other. And we can do that in people's homes or basically anywhere the church gathers, we can do that. <coughs> and we are doing great damage to the message of the New Testament by calling man-made buildings churches. If every Christian on the planet would never call a building a church again, 
This alone would create a revolution in our faith. And I agree with that. <clears throat> with that being said, he says here, uh, New Testament scholar Robert Banks says the average size church included 30 to, 30 to 35 people. That's a, that's a really astounding thing. So most churches, and I'm going to go ahead and end with this, most churches were small. And because most churches were small, again, 30 to 35 people, um, you had the ability to do all these home churches. What, what did that give birth to? If you were called the pastor, that gave room for you to basically be a pastor. Remember in Ephesians 4.11, God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then pastors, teachers. Right? Well, if you're called to be a pastor, if you're called to be an elder, you're called to be an overseer, if you will. If you believe you have a pastoral ministry, if every home church was about, you know, 30 to 35 people, that gives the, you the ability to have more pastors in that city. If you go to a lot of churches today, that will never happen, particularly if it's a mega church. Because there's only going to be, there's only one senior pastor, and there's only three or four, like, um, staff members. They usually call it, like, a, a campus pastor or something like that. So there's only, like, three or four people who, in the whole entire mega church, who actually preach. The other three to 5,000 people just sit in their butt and they watch the three to five people preach. You have the senior pastors followed by about three or four campus pastors, and they'll call them pastors or campus pastors, but they're the only, they're the only three or four people in the whole entire church who ever preach. The other three to 5,000 people just sit there and do nothing. Well, what if you're one of the three to 5,000 people sitting on your butt and you're called to be a pastor? When do you ever get a taste? When do you, when do you ever get a turn? When do you ever... All right, when do you when do you become a pastor? How do you how when do you become a pastor? How do you become a pastor? Because in that system, you're never going to get a turn. You're never going to have the ability to be on that stage, if you will, because the pastors won't give it up. And by the way, this is a problem in a lot of churches because I've been in church services where the pastors like, look, nobody gets a turn here. So if you're thinking you're going to preach, go ahead and forget it. Okay. One that could be very prideful on the pastor because he's basically saying, you're not going to steal my thunder. Now, I'm not going to accuse him of that, but that could be that. The other question I would have in response to that then is, okay, pastor, if that's how it is or if that's how you think it is, what if I'm called the pastor? How are you going to help me be one of the next pastors in this church and hopefully you eventually send me out? So if I am called the pastor in this church, what are you going to do to help me since, you know, you've... Now, granted, there is something to set up, you know, you just want to be a pastor because you want to have the mic. You know, you want to be on the stage, which again, Frank Viola and many other videos I did before, he comes against that. He comes against this rock star celebrity pastor mentality. And a lot of these bishops are saying, look, if you, if you want to be up here to be the next rock star or whatever, that's not going to happen. And I agree with that in the sense of it ain't about show, it ain't about fluff, it's not about ego, and that's true. But it begs the question, then one, Bishop, how did you become that guy then? Because to a lot of people, you're that celebrity rock star person. So you're not going to let anybody else be that, but you're that. Are you seeing the hypocrisy of that? Are you seeing the hypocrisy? So I, I understand checking people's ego and checking people's pride. I get that. But if the pastor saying that is the celebrity person behind the pulpit, he's basically saying, look, y'all, you're, you're never going to be like me. Well, that's pride and arrogance and e egotistical narcissism of the bishop, is it not? Yes, it is. But two, again, so what, again, what if you're a person who is called the pastor, though? How do you get educated? How do you become the next pastor of that church if the bishop or that church isn't going to do anything for you? So by default, you have to leave that church and start your own church anyway. So it's just a system of repeated stupidity. It's just a system of, you know, repeated stupidity. And that's what happens. And that's what happens. So, but if you have many, 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 many churches within that, home churches, by the way, not a building, home churches within that city, then you can have many, 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 many pastors and you don't have to worry about competing for a mic because that was never what it was about for anyway. Woo! So you can eliminate that whole entire dilemma or that whole entire confusion or that whole entire power struggle you can eliminate that whole entire thing if you just had numerous home churches throughout the city. And appoint elders, appoint leaders, appoint overseers in every home church, you can avoid that whole entire power struggle. Because it's not even about that.
Which, by the way, is exactly what Paul was coming against in 1 Corinthians when it says, some of you say, I'm a Paul, and some of you say, I'm a Peter, and some of you say, I'm Apollos. And guess what? P uh, Paul rebuked him for all that. Paul rebuked him for all that. Because he said, is, is, the house, or is, is, is the body of Christ divided? And he said, no, it's not. So therefore, we shouldn't be divided either. If you do it according to the Bible, you totally, completely get rid of that power struggle, saints. You completely get rid of that power struggle. So the early church met in homes, and you also get rid of the billions and billions and billions of dollars we're spending in America on buildings and overhead and everything else. Again, tearing down the sacred cow of the church building. That's what we're talking about today. Again, <clears throat> the house of God was not talking about a building, it was talking about us. It became known as the house of God later. Also, too, this is a really good point. Hebrews 10.25 not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together when telling members they should go to church on Sunday mornings. Okay? Have you ever heard that? Well, you know, we need to go to church because, you know, if you don't go to church, you're forsaking the gathering of the saints together. Have you ever heard that? And they quote Hebrews 10.25 here. The gathering of the saints could be anywhere you go. Home churches or anywhere else. But see, pastors, because they've been brainwashed into thinking, you know, being assembled together means going to church on Sunday mornings. That's not biblically what it was. As long as you're coming together in fellowship with other saints, you are not violating that verse. As long as you come together in homes and have meals and have fellowship, praise God, then you're not forsaking the assembling of your saints together because you are assembling and gathering together. It doesn't have to be in a church building on Sunday mornings. But a lot of pastors use that as a means to say, look, your butt needs to be in church. I, you need to come to this church on Sunday morning, this building on Sunday morning. And they're using Hebrews 10.25 as the justification for that, but that was never the point of what that verse was talking about. It's just basically just don't give up assembling yourselves together. But when you use it like that, it says it reinforces the misconception that when the New Testament writers talked about church, what they had in mind is passively sitting through a service in a special building once a week. But in fact, the New Testament vision of the church meeting is one in every member functions and participates in the gathering. Woo! Every member functions and participates in the gathering. And as we have established, the church building defeats the purpose of its architecture. Hallelujah. And you'll see that again in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul talks about all the gifts, you know, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, healings, miracles, faith, you know, all these, all these different types of gifts. And it basically says, if you continue to read 1 Corinthians 12, those gifts were for the edification of the body in a public setting. So these gifts were supposed to be in operation, but they were supposed to be in operation as the saints were coming together. But a lot of times in churches, unless the praise and worship team or the pastor operates in these gifts, these gifts will never be in operation. Because why? Because the model that's presented is there's no way that they have time for them to come forth. Because again, you go to church, praise and worship, sermon, go home. Praise and worship, sermon, go home. That's the model. And we just sit there as spectators, and we never participate. So if we have anything in us, gifts or anything like that, there's never an opportunity for those things to be used in a corporate setting because in most churches, our model doesn't give opportunity for those things to happen. But if you go back and read 1 Corinthians 12, and in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about love because love is the more excellent way. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, do all pray in tongues? Do all interpret? Do all have this and that? And the answer is no, but the point is some do. And as some do, they should be used and used it used accordingly. This is, I'll set the rest in order as they come. So use these gifts decently and in order, but use them decently and in order to edify the body as you come together in a corporate setting. So it was all a corporate setting. The problem is, in a lot of churches, this never happens because of their model, which we have. We sit back and we spectate instead of participating in the gathering. Which in doing so, that brings a lot of stuff out of us. So we can be edified because the gifts and the talents and the abilities and things that God has given us can participate and add to the building up of one another too. It's not just the pastor spoon feeding us. We have the power and the ability, if you will, in these smaller gatherings to participate in the gathering like everybody else. So we don't just sit back and spectate. We participate in the gathering in our homes and all of us can be edified because we're all using our gift, talents, abilities for God. In most churches, it's not like that because the model in which we've made it. Amen? 
So I'm going to go ahead and stop right there. That's the first page. Um, again, we talked about also too the um, <clears throat> we talked about the um, the sacred cow of the pulpit. Later on, he talks about the sacred cow of the sermon. Woo, that's going to offend a lot of people. The sacred cow of the pastor. Woo, that's going to offend a lot of people too. Uh, the way we dress, he calls it Sunday morning costumes. Boy, but the ministers of music. Boy, he's got a lot of stuff in here. Tithing and clergy salaries. Boy, I've talked about that a lot too. Um, we talked about the baptism and the Lord's Supper. Again, the Lord's Supper was a communal meal. Uh, Christian education. Boy, he talks about um, like going to seminary and stuff like that. Boy, that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers too. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of stuff in here. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into it, okay? I'm going to go ahead and stop there because I'm, I'm now I'm at 40 minutes. But again, this is tearing down the sacred cows of the church. This is item number one, the sacred cow of the church building, okay? Now again... I don't mind institutionalized churches. I'm not going to say, look, leave your church and start a home church. I'm not going to say that. If your church is doing good things and if God's leading you there, by all means, stay there. But what I am trying to do in this series is to get you to think differently. Get you to think differently. Okay? We're spending literally billions of dollars on buildings that don't need to be happening. And we could use that money to bless the poor saints that are in our churches and also the poor in our communities. We could use the money like they did in the Bible to take care of people instead of taking care of a building. I like the way one person says it, you know, we're building churches, i.e. buildings, but are we building people? We're building buildings, but are we building people? That's a question you've got to ask yourself. If your church is doing that, by all means, praise God. If they're not, there's a problem. Okay? So I'm not telling you to leave your church and start a home church and, you know, you know, we're not going to take it. And you just totally rebel against everything. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, let's start educating yourself so we can, make, start, we can start making more sound, educated, better decisions as what the Holy Spirit is trying to, to tell us to do. Amen? So if you like that, hit the like button, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button. Until next time, know that God loves you too. God bless everybody.